Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? It's Adam Kaplan and Jeff Mosher for Inside the Birds. And, of course, it's the middle of the week. And we have some carnage to sift through, if that's the, the best way that I can phrase it, Adam. I mean, that was an ugly 27-17 loss to the point where we did our post-game podcast, right? And I think you and I felt the same way. I mean, what were we going to say after that game that was going to be so profound and different than what people witnessed just watching it at home? Um, we both had our reactions. We both know that there's a lot of things, not just one, two, or three things wrong with the Eagles. And, and this episode, what we're going to do is give the source breakdown, as we normally do, but we're also going to get into a little bit of, of what we heard coming out of the press conferences, which I thought were kind of interesting so far this week. And it's early. There's more. There's more left very, to come. And by the way, very telling. Where yeah, where a play caller, a head coach, and a defensive coordinator look at things. I'll mm -hmm. get into that. I just thought it was important to do that because we haven't done enough of that because we've had so much information to get through every show. We just can't get to certain things. But like you said, I, I mean, we're, we're obviously going to get to do a breakdown. I have some interesting thoughts on Wednesday that I've gotten from people from other teams who I, I talked to one guy. I think on was it Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. who had already completed his advance on the Eagles. And he actually asked me, he goes, are they aware? He goes, he goes, you know Philly well. Do you think they're aware that Wentz is staring down his past targets, this, that, and the other? I said, of course they are. I said, yeah. He goes, man, he goes, it's got progressively worse. Go, okay. I said, that's it's good information. It's disappointing to hear that, but that's you're just going by what you see. It's your job. I understand that. Right. Um, but, you know, we learn as we, we speak. And, and then from a club standpoint, you know, the, the head coach said some things, which I take umbrage with, with about, and quite frankly, because so did other people I really respect around the league, which are, who I ran through. And I know, you, you know, you've got some strong opinions on it, and we'll get through that. So there's a lot to get to in the show. Yeah, very much a lot to get to. So uh, we'll get the business out of the way first that uh, everybody knows to check out the Inside the Birds pregame live show, Inside the Birds live pregame show on Sunday. We'll be uh, previewing the Eagles-Browns game, myself, you yourself, uh, Trey Thomas, and Greg Cosell starting at 10 a.m. as we always do. So make sure you're checking that out on our Inside the Birds YouTube channel, Facebook page, or our Twitter account at Inside Birds. Uh, follow us also on Twitter at Jeff Mosher NFL and at Adam Cap at Kaplan NFL. Uh, the latest Tales from the Blind Side is out. It's got Trey Thomas, Jamal Jackson, Todd Harriman's. A big theme was accountability. That's something that we've all talked about uh, all year long uh, and what the coaching staff is doing to hold players accountable and what players are doing to hold themselves accountable when they don't perform well. And I think it's interesting to hear it from people, not just you and I, Adam, but obviously people who played the game uh, and getting their perspective. So got to check that out on the YouTube channel as well and any podcast platform. And of course, Grilling the Birds with Trey Thomas and Derek Gunn will also be out this week on all of our platforms. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the transactions because I think the interesting one, yeah. Adam, was of course, Zach Ertz getting activated into the 21-day window. Now, it's hard to know what to make of these things, right? Because we were the, two weeks ago for the Dallas game, it seemed like anybody who was activated into the window played that weekend. Uh, last week, Sayamalu was activated in, but he clearly wasn't ready to play. Yeah. So the Eagles on Sayamalu, the Eagles went into the week thinking he was going to play. I was told by two pretty good sources they felt pretty good that he would play. But the problem is when you're coming back from a significant knee injury, this is a significant knee sprain as, as I understand it, you really don't know until he practices. And as the week progressed, I think Peterson actually, whatever press conference was, maybe it was Thursday. Well, he doesn't do it Thursday, so maybe it was no, Friday. I think it was Friday where right. he alluded to it, yeah. Right. I could hear in his voice that it was, it, wasn't, it was certainly not a done deal. And I remember putting in my notes Saturday, even before they, they announced any of the transactions, I was like, I, it doesn't sound like from when I was hearing he was going to be activated. So we'll see what happens this week. Um, but getting back to Zach, look, I, I, I'd said it the, the, when he got hurt, uh, he was told. I had heard that uh, it was a four- to six-week recovery. Uh, this is on the early side. This is the fourth week. I mean, he, conceivably, he could be back this week. Uh, and I've said this for years. I mean, Zach normally comes back a little bit earlier than you expect from injuries. And as a matter of fact, there was, a, there was an injury which almost really ended his career uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, chest injury, which it was in a spot where you get concerned, but he came back from that early. He came back from the uh, sports muscle core surgery really early. He just has a history, 
you know, he really cares about the club and coming back early and doing the right thing. So uh, we'll see. Well, the only thing is they don't, they don't have to put any information out on this. They're not required to by the league. I wish the league, by the way, would change that. That if the guy practices, you have to put a report on him. Who cares if he's on injured reserve? Did, did he work or not? How much did he do? I'd like to know that. But yeah, that okay. does make sense. I agree. With the you. only team that did it was the Jaguars. They did it with um, a backup running back uh, Ozigbo when uh, he was come back from a hamstring injury. But so that's what that's right now where Zach is. Right. Okay. So I guess we'll have to like we say every week, we'll have to see how he does a practice and and the kind of read between the lines or read the tea leaves of what the coaches say. Uh, on on Thursday and Friday when they do their press conference, we'll, we'll know. We'll, we'll we'll definitely know this. We'll we'll know. Yeah. We'll, we'll know. We might actually have something on this for Friday Friday morning show because I'll I'll try to get practice intel on Wednesday and Thursday just to see where he's at. Sure. But like you said, Doug's usually pretty. Doug, I'll say this about Peterson. All the issues I've had with him this season in terms of coaching, uh, I've had my issues in the way that the team has been run. But someone is just evaluating the thing. But I do like he's generally pretty straight up with injuries. Mm-hmm. And he's also not always right. N- not every head coach, when they're trying to project if the guy's going to play or not. But if you've been win- reading between the lines this season, he's been fairly accurate with his prognostication on if the guy's ready or not. That is true. Um, next guy uh, is Craig James, who went on IR with a shoulder injury that he's already been missing games for. So to me, that's interesting. They wanted the roster spot open, clearly. Um, and I don't know if this is going – I mean, nobody knows because you don't have to designate it. If this is going to be three more weeks upon oh, yeah. the weeks that he already missed or if this is yeah. – like they tried to see if it will get better. It's not, and he may be out for, for much longer. But the, the reality is they have, you know, very thin margin of, of error or injury at cornerback now because of their lack of depth at that position, which we talked about a lot in the offseason and preseason going into the year. Yeah, I, I would say on James, though, he got hurt in last week's pra- um, Wednesday or Thursday practice because it was a really odd deal. And I mm-hmm. see this a little bit over the le- around the league. He came in with a hamstring injury. That's the way he was listed on Wednesday. On Friday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say – it was either Thursday or Friday. They changed. They took the hamstring off, but they put the shoulder on there. That would indicate that this is the new injury, which it had to be. And it, then he got hurt in practice. Now, as you said, he's on IR. And then um, – the, the, the guys who were brought up last weekend were, were uh, also added on Monday. They, they, were, they reverted back to the practice squad, Wilson, McGill, and Jaquette. Right. Uh, Jaquette, who all of a sudden is now the number one backup corner on the outside. How about that, huh? undrafted free agent. Yeah. So uh, it's been that kind of a year for the Eagles and their depth. Of course, they brought back Adrian Killens, the practice squad. Uh, as you mentioned, they, protect, they protected the tight end, Caleb Wilson, uh, Raekwon. The Chef Williams and Graylin Arnold also protected. Now, as for the injuries, <laughs> you, you made a, such a brilliant observation. in the la- how oh, Nate, I did? <laughs> Nate, Nate Herbig was never on the injury report, but he never played except for special teams that one snap, which enabled oh, yeah, them yeah. to play him but yeah. keep him off the injury report throughout the week, which is a little uh, – No, he was. No, no, no. What happened oh, was he was. He was. No, no, right. what happened That's was – he was, but what happened is they didn't give him what's called an injury status. Mm-hmm. It's, it's considered probable is the way to explain to me. I, I asked this question years ago because when they, when they changed injury reports like six or seven years ago where teams didn't have to list statuses until Friday. Remember, they used to have to do it on Wednesday. Clubs complained because how are you going to tell me that I got to say the guy's questionable on Wednesday? He didn't even pra- He's only one day of practice. What? They, they didn't, clubs didn't want that pressure anymore, so the late game in, that's fine. Right, but so Herbig was on the injury report last Wednesday with a finger injury, uh, and they they didn't even give him a questionable or doubtful or out status on Friday, which means he's playing. And what happened was he played, but only one snap on special teams, which we didn't know anything about this. They kept it quiet. Now, what I had heard uh, heard is his hand, whatever it is, maybe it swelled. So okay, maybe it did on Saturday. They thought he might be able to – they saw in pregame warm-ups whether he was available or not. Okay, that, that, it is what it is. Then we'll see on Isaac, as we mentioned, that Rudy Ford also got hurt in the game. He, he had another injury. He's had a bunch of minor injuries. This one's a hamstring, and he's important to their special teams. He's their fastest special teams player. Yeah, he is. And remember, they also have Marcus Epps remains on the COVID mm. list, and it's mm. been a couple of weeks now. And all I can say is, you know, there's, yeah, there's never been okay. any information given. You, you just no, hope that the guys okay. – No, okay. Well, they don't – yeah, they're not required to, and nor, nor should they. Right. 
Right. Um, That's why we Cole just Armstead, we okay. formerly of Temple, who's with Jacksonville, won't play this season. He's got a bad case of it. That that's concerning. Yeah, I hope he I hope I know. he hope he cleans it up. You know, it's yeah. He's been in the hospital. But, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, yeah, he's, he's been yeah. Doing, I feel yeah. bad. So uh, you know, let's hope Ford's. I mean, uh, Epps is not too bad there. But that would right. be it for injuries. Like they now again, we'll see later today on Wednesday because mm-hmm. there's we call the midweek pop up injuries, which no one knew about. This happens a lot around right. the league. So we'll see if there's anyone new that wasn't on there before. And we want to see how Sanders came came out of last week's games. He's still listed with an injury. Mm-hmm. Quadriceps for Jackson, the D-tackle, who's had this lingering for about four weeks. That's another mm-hmm. thing you want to see. Are they still listed on the injury report? That's right. All right. So um, let's get into uh, a few things from a press conference standpoint. Before we do that, of course, we're going to talk about our friends at PHLSportsNation.com, enhancing the fan experience with all their coverage of the Great Philadelphia sports teams, the Eagles, the Flyers, the Sixers, the Phillies, even the Union. They are for the fan, by the fan. That's their motto. So make sure you're checking them out at phlsportsnation.com and also on Twitter at phlsportsnation. We'll pause real quick for another word from our great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. All right, Adam. uh, The the press conferences that Doug did on Monday and – Jim Schwartz on Tuesday um, did not win them over any, any fans, specifically Doug, who was, and I almost think that there's a strategy behind this because, you know, I've got nothing better than do to, to try to parse words and figure out what's going on from a man who has generally been the same kind of guy for four years, but now all of a sudden is not the same kind of guy. And to me, I don't know. I think that there's some intentional, uh, play going on here by Doug Peterson. Um, How so? I mean, you, you heard the press conference. He was very combative, very sarcastic. Oh, I heard it. In fact, hey, Jeff, real quick. I was mm-hmm. so pissed off listening to this press conference. I seriously thought of calling you and said, let's do an ITB TV because this, this is nonsense. Right. I was so fired up. I, I usually don't care about coaches' press conferences when I, when I listen to them around the league. Yeah. But this one was such a train wreck to me in, in certain ways. Like, so, because the problem is because you're not, it's not the free for all when you're, Face to face, you got to do it through Zoom. Yep. It's hard for them to ask a follow up. I was so I was so taken aback by some of his responses. I'm like, no, this is not this is not what happened. And right. I had good intel uh, Monday morning from some people that were able to watch the tape, and it, it gave me some stuff. Like, man, I would have refuted some of the stuff that he said. Right. I, I was just I, I'm to the point with Peterson. With he's trying to he and this may be what you're saying, but I just want to say this. It may be the point with this guy that he's trying to defend himself by not admitting stuff we all know. This, this is what's it's happening true. now. It, you know, that's why I Yeah, well, maybe. I, I mean, I have two thoughts on this. One yeah. is that he has been Mr. Nice Guy for four years, right? He has always coddled the player. He's always protected his players. He has generally seen positive response by being that kind of a player's coach. I feel like he expected, at very least, going into the bye um, when he was stern on turn, turning the ball over and only, you know, he made them come in on Wednesday. So you're starting to now see a gradual shift here where Doug, and he's had to do this at times before, where Doug has to tighten the ship a little bit more. Still love on guys, but tighten the ship a little more. So he brought him in Wednesday during the, the, the bye week for a walkthrough, and he was very stern about the turnovers. And then they came out of the bye week, and I'm not absolving Doug. I'm just simply saying about from a performance standpoint, they came out of the the bye week and were just completely flat and lifeless, and it's almost like nothing Doug said worked. And so I think Doug may have looked in the mirror and said, you know what, Mr. Nice Guy is not working for this year, this group. I'm going to start to lay the hammer down. And I'm going to be – and I don't know if that forces somebody to be even combative in the press conference, but I think he's trying to project, uh, hey, you know, let's get our you-know-what together type of attitude as opposed to let's just love on everybody all the time. So you had heard – just to to make sure I heard this correctly. I heard he chewed them out after that game, yeah, by two people. Two people told me Doug chewed out the team. And I said, well, is that the first time he's ever done it? No, they said no, but he really – they said we really much. gave it to us yeah. after the yeah. game, after the and then you so, so you combine that right combine mm-hmm. the chew out with the fact that in press conferences lately, he's starting to be a little lately, more stern. Dude, he's been pissed off all year. Like well, you're, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You go back to week two. Like it all started w- with his little digs at Wentz. 
after the Rams game, Monday press conference, or the Cincinnati game on the turnovers. But just certain things he was saying, he'd never done this before. Mm-hmm. Let's fast forward to what you're saying. You know, you'd said it in our, I think our Monday morning show, the pissed off Doug. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you came up with a phrase for him. It's the angry new Doug. Doug it's yeah. the pissed off Doug. Yeah, the but, angry but, Doug. But, 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 but is it, is it showing on the field? This is my problem with this guy. How mm-hmm. are you coaching your quarterback? Are you going after him a little bit? Are you coaching him harder? We can't answer that. We're not in there. Well, no, but, but we can coaches... Yeah, we can parse through his comments, though. Uh, Doug clearly doesn't believe his play calling or his offense is, is the problem here. And we know that because he was asked about it, and he said his exact quote was, Basically, I feel like we were in a good rhythm. I think the play calls are good. And then he went on to talk about seeing the game through a quarterback's eyes and always having to be on the same page as the quarterback. And I thought it was – I said it Monday night when we were on 97.5 The Fanatic. I said I thought it was interesting that he took a question about his play calling and turned it into an answer that involved his relationship with the quarterback. And there was another answer you brought up where he talked about just his own self-scouting and wondering what he can do better. But then he also said, and wondering what I need to say to my coaches for them to be better as well. So he's, Doug is not going down. uh, If the ship is going down, Doug's saying, look, I'm not the only one who hasn't fulfilled expectations here or or what's uh, expected of me. There's other things going on here. What you just said started in week two. I think he started – May two again. This is two months ago, so I don't know exactly the right week, mm-hmm. but I noticed a change in him that he's willing to be critical of the quarterback in his own way. He's not going to say he's not going to deploy Bruce Arians. He's not going to criticize like Bruce Arians goes after Brady. He he he's done it a couple times this year. He went after <laughs> yeah. Jameis Winston last year. This is what Bruce does. Right, Doug that's not Bruce. Like that. right. right. However, this go, let me move this forward. Yeah, what he's doing right now is exactly what you said. And I've said that I said this on our I've said this a couple times on our show the last couple of weeks. If Doug goes down, he ain't going down quietly. He's no longer going to just say it's acceptable. Mm-hmm. And I do applaud him for that. But when you come out, and this is why I wanted to talk about that comment, his the play caller comment. I'm appalled by it because I asked a coach that I know really well with another team. Uh, I said, I know you don't you didn't work in Philly. Uh, I don't know if you, how much you've seen Carson Wentz, but I'm sure you're aware that he's not playing well. He goes, I, he goes, I, I, he goes, I haven't seen him this year, but I, I know he's not playing well. I said, how would you handle when your quarterback, like, aren't you going to help him? And I said, do you, have you seen the Giants? He goes, yeah, they play a lot of cover two. That's kind of what they do. Our team went against them. I said, how do you beat cover two? He goes, cover two beaters, slants, digs. He went over like I didn't write them all down, but he gave me a lot. He goes, tight ends have to be involved because they're not they're doing all they can to take away the deep ball. They're making everything in front of you. What did Peterson do to help his quarterback? I, I'm not absolving Wentz. I he didn't play well in this game. I don't care what Peterson said. Mm-hmm. What did you do to help your quarterback? What have you done to help your quarterback get out of his hands quickly? Right. Get, get him accurate, get him comfortable. Get Goddard, by the way. I know Goddard's blocking really well against for the run. I, they're, they're, they block real real well. But what are you doing consistently? Jalen Hur- J- I mean, not Jalen Hurts. J- well, Jalen Rager. I get he's a deep threat. You can run him on crossers. Okay? Fulgham sure yeah. as hell can. You, you did it like crazy. Fulgham destroyed the Steelers of all teams. What are you doing to help your quarterback be more accurate and to beat the coverage? I, I, I've got people telling me. I've asked three people now who watched that tape. Now, this guy didn't. This, this offensive coach from another team. because he. I just asked him a series of questions of how you help a struggling quarterback. Right. Um, and he, he brought up – and I, he said he'd seen the Giants tape because his team played them. So, to me, man, I, I just think that Doug needs to do a better job. And the thing that bothers me is Andy Reid, who he studied under, Andy always took responsibility. Even if he didn't believe it, he'd go, hey, listen, i got to set these guys up better. i got to do a better job. How in the world could you say that the plays were called were good? You can score 17 points. Right. That was the score- second part. It, you know, Doug says this. He clearly doesn't think he's the problem or he's the issue. Right. But I think that that's burying his head in the sand and, and right. you know, and, and, basically and, pointing and the, the fingers way, at everyone else. Right. And the Dallas game, what did they score? 15 offensive points? Are you kidding yeah, me? They were awful. They were terrible in that game. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. The quarterback is, is, is an issue. Okay. The guy's lost right now. I don't know what else the hell to say about Wentz right now. Mm-hmm. He's, he's in a fog. He didn't play well this game. 
37 pass attempts, Jeff. They scored they threw for just barely over 200 yards. Yeah. And, and by the way, good. against cover two, you could you could absolutely beat that by run after the catch. And this is a West Coast offense. That's what's supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, Wentz didn't play well this game, but he wasn't the only cul- culprit. The coaches have to do a better job. No yeah. doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, I thought the Jalen Hurts question, I believe it was Jeff McLean of the Inquirer <laughs> who asked it, was a fair question. <laughs> and the question was basically, look, you have Carson Wentz on the field – drawing coverage uh, but you know you're not going to really throw it to him uh, except for that one time that you did and then he threw it back to Jalen Hurts and you got a whopping three yards but why not have Jalen Hurts in there and a different receiver so that way you give yourself uh, another option and Doug could perfectly have said well the point I'm trying to do is have two passers on the field I'm trying to make the defense think about it I'm trying not to do just put Jalen Hurts in at quarterback and run a, run an offense because that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to confuse the defense. That that would have been an acceptable and fine answer, and it's and it certainly was an acceptable and fine question that Doug some for some reason took offense to and gave a snotty little uh, good idea. I think I'll try that. He doesn't res- no. You know, I know Jeff McClain. You know Jeff McClain. He's had an issue with Jeff McClain for a couple of years. It's not any secret. I mean, yeah, but I'm, he answers I'm, his other questions. It was clearly he's that been one. Very smart with Jeff all year. Jeff. I know that Eagles have, have had issues with this reporter. Jeff's a good mm-hmm. reporter, by the way. He, does, he writes really well. Yeah. I, I know they've had some issues with him. Just, just based on – just he's, he's, he's had some really interesting reporting, which has not been very complimentary of, of, of foot, the, you know, football operations and other people and so forth. And, yeah, he uh, certainly does not kiss their rear ends. That's, no, that's, everyone exactly. Knows that. so, so anyway, to move this forward, uh, this is it. You're exactly right. He absolutely could have answered it. And by the way, Breeze is not – he doesn't. He doesn't always come off the field. There's sometimes he's on the field when when Taysom Hill's that on. That is there. true. That is true. So, I think that. But the point was that there are some times where they do take him off the field. Breeze yes. off the field. And we have not seen that yet. I don't think with Carson Wentz. Yeah. And and by the way, I remember. And it's going to be funny. I remember Bill O'Brien telling me. I I, I talked to him at the con, uh, the owners and owners meetings. The senior ball some years ago. He said he actually liked the rep the, the rapport with the media because he could actually teach him the game. This is a perfect teaching point to tell a reporter, hey, and the fans, because you're talking to the fans, hey, when we run this, we're not going to give away. There's certain things you don't have to tell them, but you could say, hey, listen, when we put Jalen Hurts in here, he's a different quarterback than Carson. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're both athletic, but Hurts is a younger player. There's certain things we'd like to get out of this Hurts formation, this Hurts series, this Hurts play. Um, There's a way he he could have done this instead of being a smart ass. And it's just it's just an opportunity to to be better about it. But Doug is, as you've outlined many times on our show for 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 a while now, he's pissed off. He's kind of had enough, and uh, uh, you and I are seeing it out of the same prism. It's very clear to me that um, he's he's. I also think he's feeling the pressure a little bit. This is just me speaking. It just it's just me. This is an opinion. No one's told me this. I just I feel like the the, the team is underachieving. We all know this because the, the roster is way better than they're playing. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't reflect very well of him as a head coach when the team is playing like this, period. Right, right. All right, let's get, let's get into Jim Schwartz because we can't let him off the hook as no, well. Is, yeah, yeah, he's funny. So he was asked about why they're having a tough time stopping uh, the running game, especially lately, because Jim's always had a good run defense since he's been here. Yes. And I think it's fair to say he's always had a disciplined – they haven't always been great. There have been times where they give up points because they get beat over the top. I think when they do too poorly, that's that's usually the reason. They very rarely get, get run on. There are a couple of games I remember two years ago where Barkley and then somebody else ripped oh, them up. Oh, screens. Oh, well, well Barkley killed even, them. Even with runs, game. but they were really yes. hurting yes. at that point. I mean, yes. this is atypical what we're seeing. And Jim's first comment was, well, you know, a lot of those running yards came from Daniel Jones. <laughs> well, that's, that's still not but good. But you know what? Okay, okay. Here's the problem with that. I, at least I can only speak for myself. I will no longer talk, specifically with this team, mm-hmm. I will no longer talk about the running backs. I'm going to talk about the run game defense. Okay. Because Eagles are so bad against athletic quarterbacks and misdirection. Yep. Yep. And, and I, 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 I'll give Schwartz credit for one thing, though. In his Tuesday press conference, he was clearly pissed off about that it happened again with Jones. He's, I, I, I don't know the guy, Schwartz, at all. I mean, I've said hi to him maybe once. I, I don't, really don't know him but I know guys mm-hmm. that work for him mm-hmm. and he, you know, he's got, to, he's, he can get salty and it's got to drive a coach crazy because you feel like you're teaching the crack way. There, there's certain rules that the, that the linebackers have or the DNs have specific against zone read. 
And when you when you don't fit it right, as he said, it's like you've been over to practice. How the hell could you not do it right in the game? He, it must drive him crazy. But, J- Jeff, you have the list there, and, and it's not quite like he said. No, it's really not. And first of all, he, he made a point of saying that the actual running backs average 3.2 yards per carry, which he wasn't really uh, uh, upset about. But, you know, yeah, that's true. Wayne Goldman only averaged 2.9. But Alfred Morris averaged 4.3 yards per carry on eight carries. I mean, you can't let – they have a bad offensive line, and Alfred Morris is a slow journeyman running back, and you let him average 4.3 a carry. These are the types of running backs that in the past – the Eagles would just swarm and stop and put the offense in third and second and long. And to think that, you know, through the first eight weeks of the season, you know, you haven't really seen you, Joe Mixon and that Bengals offense, although Joe has, you know, obviously had, had some difficulties because they're, they're a different type of offense. Their line now, is right? terrible, by the way. The yeah, Bengals and they have a bad offensive football. line. Right. right. They, right. They, 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 were, they didn't get to see Raheem Mostert. Week two against our week explosive uh, four, as hell. I mean, against yeah. San Francisco, yep. right? Yep. Connor, 15 for 44 and a touchdown. McLeod, as, as you, you know, you pointed out, McLeod had a couple of reverses on him. Ray, 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 Ray McLeod. And by the way, Ayuk got him on a 30 yard run. Okay. Right. So th- you, the worst is yet to come, though, my friend, right? I mean, like. Right, right, right. <laughs> a couple, couple things. Daryl Henderson got them. That, that touched that. He gatched them up the middle. Yes, he did. Uh, Daryl Henderson, 12 for 81. So guess what? Daryl Henderson, he got them. That was one running back who got him. Gibson, it was Antonio Gibson's first game as a running back in his career, mm-hmm. Full, full-time running back. He did a little bit in, in Memphis, but he was a slot receiver generally there. Mixon, they shut down. Okay, well, I know they have a bad offensive line. We'll give it to him. Raheem Mostert didn't play in that game against the Niners. Connor, they shut down. A little misdirection because they knew they can do it. They got him. Raymond McLeod, I was two for 63. I'm like, it's funny because I'm like, wait a minute. Who is, 14? Who is this guy? Oh, that guy used to be with Buffalo. Okay. Right. Jackson, see, again, run game. Lamar mm-hmm. Jackson got him nine one away, broke their bats, broke their backs. That loss in the game, they couldn't stop Jackson. Jalen Jones got him. Didn't for uh, didn't Duvernay have a uh, a reverse in that game that went might for a few yards? Yep, uh, might have been. Uh, Daniel Jones got him the next week, four for ninety two, including a run where he fell. He should have scored. He just fell. They got right. lucky there, so they got him. <laughs> Tony Pollard got them. It's a change up to Elliott. They did a good job against Elliott for the first time. Really, one of the few one of the few times they've done well against him. Uh, Jones got him again. Okay, Jones got him again. So here's the problem: they're an undisciplined defense at linebacker. They, they, th- though they're good, both Singleton and Edwards have gotten better. There's no question. They something is going on with the lack of discipline, with misdirection, and these non-running backs, quarterbacks, wide receivers in the run game. They got a real problem because it, it's already cost them games. It really has. And like we said, look who's coming up. You got. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, the best running back tandem in the league coming up this coming week against uh, Cleveland. And then you're going to move on to get Aaron Jones from Green Bay. And then you're going to get Alvin Kamara from New Kamara Orleans. Kill and them. Oh, Kamara, God. oh, God. That's, that might be ugly. Well, well here's right. the thing. We, we, we've been saying for a couple months, it shocks us that te- teams for the most part, and it may be just because the personnel wasn't good enough, they have not really attacked the Eagles linebackers very much in the past game, mm-hmm. not as much as I thought would happen. Kamara will do it. Aaron Jones will, Aaron Jones is so underrated as a pass catcher. Seattle is all beat up at running back, so I, I would dismiss that. Other than Russell Wilson, misdirection, fake handoff, go. You know, yeah. he's, he's gotten in the past. And the thing with Chubb and uh, Hunt, but they're not outside of formation running backs. Hunt will catch the ball. Chubb rarely catches it. I, I, we'll get into that on Friday's show, but I, they're, they're, they're going to have oh, – and by the way – I cannot wait. It'll be must-see TV. Well, it won't be for Eagle fans, but for all of us who love football. <laughs> Week 15 at the Cardinals. Kyler Murray, forget about it. What he is oh, doing, man. dude. Oy. It's unbelievable. He's like doing what Lamar Jackson did last year. It's, it's unbelievable. Oh, unbelievable. Um, I'll say this, though. I think what we're, sh- we're saying here, though, is that while teams might not yet have really hurt the Eagles linebackers through the passing game, they're doing it through the running game. Eagles linebackers yep. are not – they don't do a great job of getting off blocks. That's why they are who they are. And even, you know, even on that Daniel Jones run, yeah, you had uh, Josh Sweat crash the middle, but Alex Singleton could not get off the block to even limit how long that run was going to be. And uh, I thought a couple of those Alfred Morris runs up the middle showed you that those guys just were not doing a good job of getting off the blocks consistently throughout yeah. the game. And that's going to be tough when they have to defend those running backs that we just spoke about. 
All right, let's get into our film review. Uh, before that, I want to remind everybody to download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app today and get your sign-up bonus using the promo code ITB. That's promo code ITB to get all your sign-up bonuses when you download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app. All right, let's start with the Eagles' offense in their film review. I'm very, uh, very curious to hear the intel on what was seen from Carson Wentz in this game. Yeah, so he is really staring down his pass targets. It's, it's, it, it, he's also pr- he's got a very bad habit. I don't know if we saw this that much last year, particularly the, the, when he really got himself together late last year. This year, he's predetermining so many throws. So, like, there was a throw someone told me. Um, it was because they played a lot of cover two in this game, but I, I it, it was, um, was it the ones that Jalen Rager along the right sideline? No, kind of that was, it? I know the player talking about, but there was a look, this one person said that he absolutely should not have gone there. That was not the throw. It was covered. Mm-hmm. It was, he predetermined, he was throwing it anyway. And th- this is just not good football. Like this, I, I can't, cause I, I don't, I didn't play the quarterback position. Okay. I didn't play football. I don't know, and you know, we've asked Groco sell this just from a, just from what the, the guys we talk to, uh, for our shows that are on, on with us, like like Greg and Trey. But when it comes to Cosell, Greg, you know, Greg has said it many times. He doesn't know. And, and Ron Jaworski, I asked him this last week when I was on a show. Even though he played the quarterback position, sometimes you're not seeing it. But when you're predetermining what you're going to do, it's like you're, you're not listening to your coaches. Like I, I'll defend their coaches on one thing. There's some throws that Wentz is making. They're clearly not what they want. That that's not to throw. But you know, it's one thing, Jeff. If he'd been playing at elite level, like 17, part of 18, because eight, at 18, despite really no speed, he did a good job of managing the game. He did a really good job in 18. 19 mm-hmm. was we know is very up and down. This is the worst that he's played. The coaches could say whatever they want to him, but when you're not gonna when you're not gonna do it the way it's drawn up oh, hey, I thought I had this, whatever he might have said when they went over the tape and asked him why he did that. That's just not going to fly. Like, you, you just, just just do it like it's drawn up, and you'll get it. This is the, you know, the stuff that I'm getting from people who I really respect when it comes to the quarterback position. When it's drawn up correctly and the quarterback doesn't do it, it drives you crazy because it, there's, there are plays to be made, and you're not making them. Um, he didn't play well that game. I don't, I don't know what – I know Doug for years, even when – he was playing at elite level in 17. If he didn't, if he, if he had a game that wasn't quite elite, he would still defend him. He defended him in 18, most of the 19. This year, I was surprised that, and I know he's never going to come out and criticize him like really hard, mm-hmm. but I, I am kind of surprised that he felt that once played well. I just, I don't know how he came up with that because no one who's great at the tape, who knows what, who knows the game says that. It's just not true. I, I, you know, it's hard to believe that someone uh, can guide an offense that goes 0 for 9 on third down. Exactly. And How still play still well. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Doug, that's just Doug being Doug right there. Um, Miles Sanders had a good game running, not necessarily a good game receiving the ball or protecting the passer. And that was strange to me because he's caught the ball well for most of his career in this year. And, he, and he's improved in, in pass protection. I wonder if the Giants confused him at all with where they were blitzing from. He just, you know, he wasn't his normal self from, from uh, that look standpoint. My, yeah, look at my notes here. He fit the run game really well. He got skinny through the hall, hit it, He's decisive. Yeah. Terrific. He, he was great running the football. Um, he had two, at least two pass protection hours that I, I, was, I was told about. Uh, got to get better. Yeah, they, you, you might be right. You might be onto something there. Like sometimes – particularly young backs. And remember, he had missed some time here. He's missed a lot of time, unfortunately. He missed the first game of the year. And then two more games uh, with this knee injury. So it, sometimes you have to get the rhythm of being back on the field. I'm not making excuses. I'm just – this is the way he's explained to me. Mm-hmm. When you're a football player that's been out for a while, you got to – you just got to get back in the game and get your mental focus back. Because he really – one of the big things that the Eagles were surprised about, not only how well he caught the ball last season, is how quickly he got up to speed on, on pass protection rules. Uh, this was just a game. He had a couple of errors. And, and one of the throws that he dropped, still Carson needs to either lead him, throw with anticipation, but don't throw it so low. He's got to bend down and stop his movement. Right. That's what you don't want. That's what he's explained to me. And that, that, that's got to be better. And, but this is where Wentz is with his touch on his football. He's just not good enough there. Um, 
you know, we talked about yeah. going into the game, Adam, the importance of not losing Boston Scott in the sauce now that Miles Sanders was back to make sure you're using him, getting the ball in his hands, being creative with him. I, I don't think that they were necessarily – creative with him but they did make sure to get the ball in his hands and of course he had the touchdown because it was the Giants right so, mm-hmm. so uh that that's one thing I came out of the game saying hey they, they were able to do that yeah the block the, the block on the 56 yard touchdown run was, was terrific the, the, yes, the blocking was. was great in fact uh, I was told that they're I'm just throwing one line here we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the offensive line but I will will tell you that their line their run uh their run game blocking was terrific their pass game Below average is what I was told. Are you talking about the offensive line? Yep, yep, yep. That's it's, well, it's, that uh, was yeah. I thought I thought Pryor and Opeta really sh- well, obviously, but they really uh, struggled there. I thought. I would say this just as a group. We know about Kelsey's snaps; they have to be better. Yeah, just, yeah, that was bad. Goes without saying that, and he knows that it's just got to be better. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that offensive line wise, uh, pass protection, they had some issues. Uh, they. They're getting beat on games, on uh, stunts and games by the DNs, and that's the problem. And um, it just, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're really older on the offensive line. Obviously, we know where they're older. They, this is something that's going to have to be cleaned up. They have to get younger next year. They, my lot of, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how Peters does against uh, Garrett this Sunday. But um, they've got to get younger. That's the one thing. That's one take I've not only this game, but just this season. Mm-hmm. It's it's really next year's got to be turned. You have to get younger, and they they have to. Lane's not going anywhere, but they're going to have to get younger, and they have to be better in pass pro. It, it's not all on one's pass protection. It, it's certainly on the offensive line's got to do a better job. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, I, I think it makes sense that they would struggle against stunts and twists because, as Trey Thomas has described to us many times during our Sunday pregame show, a lot of that. A lot of combating the line games is about communication and your practice throughout the week of knowing what to look for. So if you're a tackle and you're going to pass a looping end off to the guard, or if you're a guard and you're going to pass the stunter off to the tackle, you guys have to be on the same page, take the, take the right type of, of uh, sets to be able to do that. But I don't think Jason Peters and Sua Opeta had played next to each other all year long, right? Because when Opeta played a couple of weeks ago, Peters wasn't back yet. So it made all the sense in the world for the Giants to try to confuse these, confuse these guys up front because they just haven't had that much time together. And I agree with you. They Fair have to point. Get younger. Yeah. yeah, very good point. Um, that that's I and I, one thing I've learned from Trey amongst many, it is it's that unsaid communication between linemen. There's just something when you, you, this is what you're illustrating, when the guys are not there, they've been played together very much if at all. There's just something that Sapatico is not there, and and I think it's shown in this game. I was told in pass protection. Mm-hmm. Just something to keep an eye on as we get into the Cleveland game, because that's going to be a fun game to break down on Monday, uh, Friday morning. But right. sticking with it, just the review of the offense. I would have running. Um, there are some issues with finishing off routes, um, mm-hmm. play strength from the receivers. Uh, Rager didn't have a great game. Uh, needs to play through some some of his routes. He just. Remember, he's missed a lot of time. And I'm not making any excuses, but this is what happens when you miss a lot of time. Mm-hmm. I, this is what I know checking into him. The game really means a lot to him. He'll get better. He didn't have a bad game. He just – there's things he has to clean up uh, with this game. And the, the, the receivers coach Moorhead's going to have to obviously bring him along here. And I would say this. I did hear a comment that Peter, uh, Peterson made with Angelo Cotoli and Money when he was clearly pissed off. Um, it was obviously still fresh with him on Angelo's show. And it was actually – I don't. I, I think it was the real Doug. I think this is probably part of what you were saying in your reporting, where you said he he got pissed off the after the mm-hmm. maybe the Dallas game. Whatever it was, he was really pissed off Monday morning with Angela. I, that's the most pissed off I've ever heard him. Hmm. Even more than sixteen when they were losing, they had a losing record. I mean, he was furious. So I, I do. I I would hope that going to this week's practices, let's leave his press conference to the side here because who the hell knows if he was telling the truth of how he really felt let's hope he's an angry guy that he's not going to settle for the mediocrity which this football team is i mean they're, they're a bad football team and the three five ones it's pathetic it's bad. i mean i don't know what else to tell you they're bad right so you would think with winning a super bowl they, they've made it they've made the playoffs three straight years he set this bar here and they're playing well below the line you would hope that he gets after his coaches as well his coaches need to be coached harder i've talked about this now for three years i've known about it i've put it on our show 
I know it would be a problem. It continues to be a problem. He actually said that in passing, Jeff, in his Monday press conference. That he, he said – I can't remember the exact phrase. And it was – what I had heard was not in the transcript, the way he said mm-hmm. it. But I do remember him saying he also needs to do better. He, the way he said it was like – and also i got to coach our coaches – better maybe something yes, like that he did he did say that he okay said, i have so to look in the mirror oh, he so, said i so have to ask myself what i it's in the trail i thought i thought right. saw it in the transcript not he the way he to... said it though not the way oh, i heard it oh uh, maybe yeah, the it tone was even a little bit different than the way it right translates exactly on right, exactly so yeah because i've been waiting for him to admit that because andy andy reed his supposed mentor one of his mentors mm-hmm. no one did it better than any coach that i've covered in 21 years of, of this business no one did it better than Andy Reid coaching his coaches. Where do you learn it? Mike Holmgren. There's sometimes you got to ride your coaches. Yeah. Sometimes you got to lay into their bleep. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of um, NFL films footage of when those two were together in Green Bay, and yeah. uh, you know Holmgren Andy, would Holmgren got on Andy. Did you yeah, see that? Yeah, yeah. They would get on each other. Yes. You know, they would fight each other, and it was. But Holmgren would walk over, like Favre would throw a pick. And Holmgren would, would walk over, and yeah. he would blame Andy, and Andy would be like, you know, settle down. He's going to come back and be fine. And those are – it's awesome footage, man. It's really right, fun to right. see. But, yeah, you're right. Holmgren was not afraid in the middle of the game to walk over to a position coach and tell him to get the – you know what, settled out. And, and let me give you – let me – and, and, so, and uh, you had said about the Doug going after the, the, the player, whatever he did. Um, two things I want to add. So I reported uh, – Michael Silver also had the same story, similar story. But I could, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail. So I, I probably talked about this once on our show, maybe a couple of years ago, but Doug can go after it. So what happened, it was either, it was at 17, it was in the playoffs. It was either before the Atlanta or Minnesota game. One of the receivers dropped the football and the coaches and players stared at it because they weren't sure if it was incomplete. And Doug went off. He said, what the bleep? You know, he just went off and he looked, turned to his coaches, hey guys, that's your guy. What the, mm-hmm. what the hell's going on? And Doug went off, and he caught the, the players and coaches' attention. Now, nobody thinks it was on purpose because it was – Doug was right. Like, what are you doing watching the football? This is embarrassing. Right. You can't do that. Right. So, it does – for people who say that Doug's incapable of going after people when it's necessary, I, I don't know that I agree with that. Now, behind the scenes, let me bring you something that Ron Jorsky told me. I was talking to uh, Jaws off the air about this. I said, D- you know, what was your relationship with Vermeil? I know you guys are very close. I know, I know Dick could bring it. I know he can get angry. He said that Dick went after him so loud. I don't know. They must have had a three-hour film session back then with the reel, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Oh, yeah. But I guess, some, I, guess, I guess you could hear Dick go after him in another part of the Veterans Stadium because that's where their offices were. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, Doug has got – now, again, we don't know this. But if Doug needs to get salty with Carson, then he's got to do it because you got to reach this kid. This kid right now, I don't know that the, the word I used earlier was fair and lost, but he's in a fog right now. This is not the – everyone seems to agree that I talked to. I, I, you know, I don't know about the people you talked to, but, Jeff, the people I talk to all think that Wentz is an elite talent. But I would put him now, if we were grading 32 starting quarterbacks, where they're at in their career – Carson mm-hmm. Wentz is a bottom 10 quarterback. That's where he is. He's, yeah, he's playing like one, no doubt about it. I remember saying week two, week three, that this can't continue because there's or, – or it's not likely to continue because there's really no evidence and in in, in no track record of being that bad. And I even used Kirk Cousins as an example because he was off to an awful start as well. He was, he was right underneath Carson in, in pass rating somewhere around 60-something, right? And I said even Kirk Cousins is probably going to wind up going on a nice little streak and getting it together because the history says that Kirk Cousins is at least a decent quarterback and sometimes a very good one. Uh, Kirk Cousins has seemingly got it together. He's playing a little bit better. The team in general, the Vikings are playing, but I think they've won three or four in a row. Three in a row, yeah. yeah. What's perplexing is that Carson really has had some moments but has not had a game where you say that is the Carson Wentz that I expect. He's had some moments in games. The Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and, and yeah. Baltimore, but he has not had a game where you're like, that was a complete Carson Wentz performance, and they're going to need him to have one soon. Yeah, we're, we're going to have an awesome guest on ITB TV. I don't want to give it away, but uh, I, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking to this person. Everyone, will, we're going to get a real answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll get someone who's been worked at a high level in the National Football League who we, we all like. So, um, so you that's, to, look, uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's move over to the defense. Yeah, uh, yeah let me see. Or you want to finish uh, off the thought? The only thing I was going to say on offense is Goddard's got to get the ball more. This is – when you're playing against his own defense, 
you got to use the tight end, man. Uh, the cover three beaters are obvious. Uh, when mm-hmm. you go against Seattle's defense or the Seattle hybrids, which other mm-hmm. teams use, mm-hmm. it's always crossers. That, that every, every D coordinator has told me, when you play cover three, you know you're going to get gashed by tight ends. you got to get Goddard with the football, man. This kid, and I know that they want him in the run game. I'm sorry. And at six targets is not enough. This kid is gifted. I, I they got to use him better. That's, I mean, it's only two games since he's been back, but he's got to get the ball more. There, there's no excuse for 37 pass attempts. This guy has four catches. Come on. That, Richard Rodgers, definitely. I know, at four, but Goddard is an explosive <laughs> guy. Come on. Yeah, it is kind of strange that some of Carson's best throws this year have come to Richard Rodgers, but <laughs> uh, that's just 2020 for you. All right, speaking of 2020, the holidays are almost upon us. Make sure you're taking advantage of the great deal that Manscaped has for ITB listeners. That's 20% off and free shipping on all their Manscaped products that you can get at manscaped.com. We've talked about them. We know you know about the lawnmower, the weed whacker, the crop wipes, the, the foot uh, powder with tea tree, tea tree cooling deodorant, you know, the, the, uh, the cologne as well. I mean, there are so many great products for men at manscaped.com. You'd be ridiculous not to take advantage of free shipping and 20% off. Get yourself the gift, if nobody else will, of great male grooming. All right, manscaped.com, code ITB. Use that promo code ITB. All right, uh, let's focus the defense. We talked a little bit about One thing. the deal line. One thing. Yeah. Okay, yes. here's what I forgot. I remembered the, the coverage. It was quarters coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I was talking about, what, where Wentz made the wrong read, he just made the wrong decision. Where he clearly was predetermined. It was quarters coverage, and he decided he was going to go. It might have been. It might have been. It was an inside throw where it absolutely was the wrong throw. Mm-hmm. And this is this is kind of what you're getting with him now, where he's predetermining stuff, and it's this is not the, the special Carson Wentz, obviously. And I'm hoping – I know the coaches show him this stuff. They just – for them, before we move to defense, for them to rescue him, they're going to have to reach him at a certain level, which they – whatever they're doing is not registering. They're going to the, – the, right now, Carson Wentz is in crisis. This is no longer a concern. It's a crisis. And they're, they're mm-hmm. going to – for them to win this division, as bad as it is, they still – right now the Giants, uh, they, not only did they, they dominated them, right now, to me, they're, they're better than the Eagles. Oh, I think that's, that's, that's fair to say. I mean, it's the series is one is one, but, uh, you know, the, the Eagles kind of squeaked by the Giants, had to come back, and then the Giants just came out and beat them by 10 points. So that's fair to say. But the way this division goes, it's week to week to week. Could be Washington yes. in three weeks. Could be the yeah. Dallas. You know, Dallas gets – um, what's his face back? Andy Dalton. Not that that's yeah. – you know, it, it's better than Ben DiNucci. I'll say that. So we'll see what happens with them. And their defense has, had, has started to play a little bit better. So it is week to week. All right, the defense, defensive line. Man, I'm, I have mixed emotions about, you know, how the defensive line played. I, they, did, they got a couple of sacks. They generated some pressure. There were times they moved Danny Jones' uh, office uh, spot. But I, I feel like it's fair to say you expected more. You expected them to be a little more stout against the run. And you expected them to finish off a few sacks and take advantage of an offensive line that's not very good. Like, they should have dominated the line of scrimmage, and I don't feel like they did from start to finish. Yeah, the uh, Andrew Thomas play well, the first round pick. Um, I, I oh, by the way, uh, you know, Jay Glazer reported Sunday morning. I knew about this, but I didn't know it was as drastic. So the defensive line coaches during the week, and I don't know if they were in the game or not uh, at all. Defensive line coaches, we know that Washburn is one of the three guys. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah Washburn was out with um, whether he has COVID or he was close contact, he was out, but apparently. Uh, Nate Ollie, the assistant coach, and uh, Matt Burke did not were not with the team Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Jake Lynch reported that on um, on Fox Football Sunday. Mm-hmm. I'd heard I'd heard earlier in the week it was Wednesday, but I didn't know they were out the whole week. I'm assuming they coached the game. I don't I don't I don't remember. But anyway, Connor Barwin coached the defensive line this week. Wow, that's what Jake reported. I was I, I first of all, how the hell is this not at, like none of the beat reporters got this? I was surprised that it didn't get out there. It was a good, good scoop. I was not aware of that. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, the Eagles did, did a good job of keeping that one in-house. Well, maybe, maybe again, now, I don't know if these guys were back on Sunday at all, but they didn't – this D-line, I know they had I know they had three sacks. They had eight quarterback hits, but come on. Daniel Jones was comfortable. Now, Schwartz alluded to it, and it's true. They were a lot of quick drops, get it out of his hands, and to get the Eagles pass rush. Okay, we've yep. seen this before against the wide nine. This is the way you defeat it without having to even scheme very much. You just get it out of the quarterback's hands quickly. 
Right. But uh, th this D-line didn't have any energy. Did you sense that? Yeah, no, I just – it's weird because the way the game started with the Derek Barnett, you know, sack, he got, uh, he got the edge on, on Andrew Thomas, and you thought, yep, you know, you kind of thought this is the game that you're coming out of the bye. They get a sack on the first play that they're ready. They're all healthy. You got everybody back. We thought that they would dominate – the line of scrimmage and what they there were times that they did and there's just times where they did not and you know the bottom line is you go look at the eagles this year and for all the money they put in the d line they do have some a decent amount of sacks but you gave up 27 to washington 37 to the rams you gave up uh 20 uh i'm sorry 38 to the steelers 28 to the uh, 30 to the ravens and uh 27 to the giants that, that, that's just too many games of between 27 and, and 30 points that you're giving up that for this defense. That's not acceptable. Right. Now, some of it was when they got gashed by quarterbacks running the football or get, you know, whatever, yeah, it whatever is. it is. It's just, it's right. just They're not, just a, not yeah. good enough. <laughs> I, the, 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 the thing is the D line actually gets a ton of, they get a lot of what quarterback pressures. They get a ton of them there. Mm -hmm. If they're not PFS, number one graded D line, they're certainly top three, but our own eyes tell us it's not, they're not, as good as those numbers would indicate. They're good. They're very good. But mm -hmm. they're not – I would like to see them take – they've not taken over a game where simply the other – the offensive line cannot handle them the whole game. Like, they've not dominated from the beginning to end yet. I'm waiting right. for that. Right. I thought the Giant game would be that. It, it certainly did not. Maybe the Dallas game. Uh, the, the, I mean, maybe a game like Cleveland. I doubt it because Cleveland's actually got a pretty good offensive line. I don't yeah. see a team – the Saints line is awesome, by the way. If you look at if you look at the offensive lines of the teams that are playing, man, I mean, they've gotten kind of the, the, the cream puffs are off their schedule right now. It's going to be really, really difficult for them. It definitely is. And the same thing as we're saying for linebackers, uh, they're going to have to get off blocks, uh, especially against Cleveland, those two big uh, interior offensive linemen that the, the, the Browns have, uh, Joe Batonio and, and the other guard whose name is a Teller. Wyatt right Teller's really good. He's been a – wow, has he been surprised. He just came back from a calf injury, but – he used right. to be the Bills. He's actually one of the more unheralded interior linemen. I'm glad you brought him up that no one knows about unless you're a Browns fan. Yeah. Yeah, he's been good. I just uh, – you know, the, the linebackers, they had, they had issues in this game, is what I was told by a couple people. They had, they had their moments, but overall they, they didn't play well. I mean, it's did, just – Yeah, did you well. notice that Davion Taylor actually played, I think, three snaps in the game? No, I didn't even – I didn't, didn't either. I, didn't even <laughs> I don't know what, what was the determination – that got him on the field for those three snaps. Perhaps it was goal line, and they were just, you know, sometimes you'll see four or five linebackers get in there on goal line. But, uh, yeah, I didn't notice it either. So and one, one thing I would add, though, uh, before we go to the secondary, is that, you know, Schwartz talks about, oh, they're whatever three point, whatever yardage they're giving up against running backs. What Jim is not saying, because someone else pointed this out to me, so I figured I'd use it. What Jim ought to look at is how many short yardage runs these guys have had and how many touchdowns they've given up the running back. They've got a ton of rushing touchdowns. Oh, the red zone defense has been terrible all year yeah, long. So, so yeah. look, this has not been one of Jim Schwartz's best years. Let's, let's call it like it is. Right. I think Jim's a sound top 10 defensive coordinator, but if you went through 32 teams, look like they're like seven or eight teams that don't really have a defense coordinator. The head coach calls the defense. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I know they've had their injuries, but you said it. You're right. The D line is healthy as hell right now. There's no excuse. No, no. Right. Excuse. So, right. So, so I got to the val the, the, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Validate you. Cause I know a couple of weeks ago I said, Adam, I got a bone to pick with you. I think uh -oh. we're being uh -oh. a little premature on Avante Maddox. I said, you know, he was hurt. You, we haven't really given him a chance to really see what he can do for the long term on the outside. He's a nickel corner. He's a slot corner. That's pretty much obvious. The slot corner that you you thought that I think all of us thought was a good value signing oh. of Nickel Robi, Roby Coleman has not been that great either. Dropped an easy interception in his hand, which could have swung the momentum of the game. This you know outside of Darius Slay, who also had uh, some eh moments in that game, the secondary's not been very good. Well, it, it, and McLeod, McLeod's been good. Rodney's had a good year, but if I. Like, they drafted him. Everyone knows they drafted him to be their slot corner, their nickel corner. Okay, that because he's got most nickels who are five foot nine are not very fast. He he could run. Okay, mm -hmm. he may not play to his whatever four three whatever his speed was at the combine, but he, he's fast for a slot corner. They thought, and I, I don't know the reason for this. I never got a straight answer. They and I'm sure Schwartz Schwartz didn't make the calls on his decision, but they have to go to him. Hey Jim, we're thinking of not spending 
any more money because we're paying Slay. Do you think Avante Maddox could play on the outside? And you know how much he loves Avante. Mm -hmm. He's smart. He's athletic. I remember we did the show. Um, it was Alshon's first game in 18 against Tennessee when Avante played safety. We were shocked. We were shocked. Like Jim put right. him, we knew he was smart. That's why he did it. Right. But you are what you are. You, you, if you have a five nine corner, you, you better be a great coverage corner on the outside to play that to be that short. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not. He's an inside corner who's smart, tough, and athletic, but just not it didn't work. I mean, it did it, they, they they this is something they have to, they have to know because they're watching the tape. Mm -hmm. Our people are telling us the same thing that you just mentioned. So it is what it is, and they'll, they'll, they'll have to correct that next year. I'm sure they will. It's one of many things they got to do. Um, this, this, this Jaquette kid, well, we're going to – the fact that they, you know, on Tuesday they signed him off their practice squad, which I, I'm surprised they did that, that this early. That would tell me that someone else wanted him. Has mm -hmm. to be. Why mm -hmm. would you do that now? You could just wait till Saturday. And they, in fact, they, they, um, they, they could have waited. But um, obviously some, someone had to be on him. Um, and – they did not protect him because they, what they did is they, they signed him off their practice squad on Tuesday and, and protected three other players. Mm -hmm. it's, my sense is someone else wanted him. Anyway. Interesting. Uh, did you happen to see the stat line for Sidney Jones against the Packers? I know he's playing well. I know. And I he know. had like, he had two interceptions, I think. I believe like seven tackles. He had two PBUs. Uh, I'm sorry, seven pass breakups, I think it was. Uh, it Here's was I know. Oh, uh, Cosell said it. Greg said he's been playing well. But here's the thing about Sidney Jones. Yeah. He had to go. He, he was bad here. I know. I know. He was, he was even hurt again Awful this game. training camp. I, I know that. The, I, yeah. It's not that they cut him. He, ha he deserved to be cut. It's why is it yes. that another team has been able to, A, keep him healthy, and, B, get production out of him when the Eagles could not. But a different scheme. You know, de okay, they're, they're, they're running – Todd Wash is their decorator. He's running the Seattle scheme. But well, you've got to right. draft players who fit your scheme, though. So that becomes right. an issue right. in one way or another, whether it's coaching, right. whether it's scouting, it's whether shame. it's – right. Now, the one that bothers me and still does is the LJ Fort one. That, they were wrong on that. Mm -hmm. Ken Flagell was totally wrong on that. I don't care what he says. Yeah, LJ, LJ, I don't care if he's been in 50 teams, okay? Right. The guy, the guy was one of the two best linebackers. In fact, one person said he was their best linebacker in training camp last year. Yep. I don't care about the compensatory pick. Your, your, your job is, as a person on staff, to make sure you put your best players on the field, not worry about what the coaches think. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. It was. It was a mistake because not only did he play well for Baltimore and get extension after two months, their linebackers have been such a disappointment, though they're getting better now but they're not still at a, a, a good enough level. They're, they're getting better, but they're also undrafted free agents. And mm -hmm. you have what you have. And that the, the Fort one, it stings a little for them because you hate to see it. You know, you hate to see it when you cut a guy where you think, you, you know, you, the, the, the linebacker coach clearly didn't want him, and he goes, he goes somewhere else and plays well. It's kind of it's messed up. Yeah, and then the guy that the linebacker coach did want doesn't even play at an adequate level. I mean, he was playing at a horrific level – before Nate Gary got hurt. So it just adds all the insult to injury yep. when, when, you, yep. when you wrap it up. And, and, you know, final thought on this overall is that it also stings that you're getting nothing from last year's first-round pick because he's hurt. You're getting nothing from last year's 57th overall pick because he's now inactive to be uh, – to clear room for Alshon Jeffrey, who played six snaps. or No, no, we played more than that. But he, he had zero catches. You're getting nothing from your second-round pick this year other than – two or three snaps a game and a couple of them were getting fumbled and you're getting nothing from your third round pick this year. So you add it up all together and that's, that's four players that are not giving you anything right now. And that's very difficult when you're trying to balance flipping a roster while also having some good veterans. Right. A couple of things on, on the secondary Schwartz is absolutely right on what he said, because they're around the ball, but they're getting lost in coverage. Like the, the one that Slayton beat him slay for 40 yards. Yeah. You could see he's there because some D-backs, they'll, they'll, they're going to play the man and they're just going to wait till the guy's acting like he's going to catch it and they'll put their hand up because they don't, they they don't know where the ball is. So it's the technique that they're using. But there, he just he didn't see it and he got beat. Maddox has had issues this season with ball location. Mm -hmm. uh, the way he's explained to me is it's, it's kind of happening a lot. And it, it, I can't answer this because I'm not a coach. I don't know why it's happening. It's just we know what – you know, the people I speak with pointed this out to me. More than one person has pointed out his ball location is just not good enough when he plays on the outside. Uh, maybe it's because he hasn't had enough snaps out there. I, I can't answer that. But the fact of the matter is um, 
they've got so many holes and issues and things to clean up. I, I am still, I am stunned that they came out so flat after the buy. I, I, I don't know, but Peterson's got to get after now. And, and I'll tell you what, um, it's just going to get hard for this football team. And it's the first time that, that we've covered Peterson on the show that I don't know that it's going to turn around. I, I, every time I said, nope, it's going to turn it around. He's resilient. That's why mm-hmm. I, I still have a lot of respect for the guy, but he, he, some has got lost here in, tra- in, in translation to his players because, and also his coaches, cause he's got to coach them harder, man. This is, this is inexcusable after the body come out like this. This is a joke. Absolutely. It was joke. bad. It was, it was worse than I could have even imagined. Uh, and as you're mentioning, it doesn't get any easier. It becomes even more of an uphill climb. We'll preview the game on Friday, 6 a.m. when the next pod drops. That's going to do it for this episode of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. We thank, of course, our producer, Hunter Brody. Check out his work on YouTube. His channel is called Sports Talk with Broads. And make sure you're following him on Twitter, at Broads81. And as always, we thank you for flying with us inside the birds.